the subject could not be more important. Um, right now, as I speak to you, I think that the risk of nuclear use is greater than any other time in the last uh, six decades. Russia has more nuclear weapons than any other country in the world. And it has a more diverse nuclear arsenal than any other country in the world. And Russia is committing crimes against humanity every single day uh, for more than a year, year and a half. And if you go back to um, uh, the war in Syria, uh, we are seeing a willingness to target civilians, to target civilian infrastructure, and commit war crimes that's become daily and routine. Uh, yesterday's destruction of the Kafkovka Dam is uh, an extraordinary event. And it's really important to keep in mind that there are nuclear weapons in the Russian arsenal that would cause much less damage than the destruction that has already been committed against Ukrainian cities and uh, the catastrophic destruction that was caused uh, yesterday, whose implications are going to last for years. So if I were to bet, I would bet that Russia will not use a nuclear weapon uh, against Ukraine. But if this conference is interrupted by a news report that Russia has done so, it certainly wouldn't be shocking um, or surprising. So we're at a very, very dangerous moment right now. Uh, not only is uh, Russia showing the willingness to destroy um, civilian infrastructure and terrorize civilians. But what we have right now is an unprecedented amount of propaganda from Russia on behalf of nuclear weapons, almost a daily celebration of the use of nuclear weapons by Russian propagandists that's unlike anything that occurred during the Cold War. Uh, and this rhetoric from the official uh, Russian propaganda outlets is almost normalizing the use of nuclear weapons and preparing the Russian public uh, for their use. A lot of this is being done to deter uh, uh, NATO and Western support for Ukraine but it's highly, highly irresponsible uh, rhetoric about nuclear weapons. Um, so that's where we are right now. And yet there is, a, I think, an enormous gap between the reality of the nuclear threat right now and the public perception of it. There is a, a profound historical amnesia about nuclear weapons, about how close we came again and again during the Cold War to a nuclear war, and about what the danger is from these machines right now as I speak. This wasn't always the case. Um, when I was young, which was a while ago, but you know, really we're talking about the 1980s, when I was in college, nuclear weapons were a daily subject of discussion and were widely reported um, in the mass media in the United States and in the West. Um, opinion polls showed while Ron Ronald Reagan was president that about half the American people expected to die in a nuclear war. 
And when I was at college, uh, nuclear weapons, the threat of nuclear war was omnipresent. It was just something that we all thought about, we all talked about. There was a remarkable amount of knowledge about weapon systems, about nuclear strategy. And when the Cold War ended, without the use of a nuclear weapon, and when the Berlin Wall came down in the early 1990s, there was just an enormous sense of relief. This existential threat that had really dominated the world since the early 1950s seemed to have gone away. And it no longer was a topic of discussion. And it seems to have been largely forgotten. But that threat never went away. It just, it just was put into the background of the national consciousness. Um, in the early 2000s, I started thinking about nuclear weapons again. And what prompted it was the, uh, the growing arms race between India and Pakistan. But it prompted me to look back at the Cold War making use of all these documents that had been declassified uh, since the end of the Cold War. And write, I wanted to write a book that would remind people of the nuclear threat and show how close we came again and again to losing control of this technology uh, and how close we came again and again to catastrophic um, events. Now, it's a real honor and it's quite flattering that 10 years after the publication of my book that I'm being invited to talk on this subject. And it's quite gratifying that my book is still in print. And I would like to think that's the case because I'm such a smart guy and I'm such a wonderful writer and I'm such a great reporter. And the reality is that the strength of command and control is entirely based on the mentors that I had during the research. My graduate degree is in British imperial history. I am in so many ways totally unqualified to write about or speak about nuclear weapons. But I learned so much from a handful of people who really understood this subject and to whom I am profoundly grateful. And sadly, many of them no longer alive. Bob Purifoy and Bill Stevens, nuclear weapons designers at the Sandia lab. Harold Agnew, who was the former head of Los Alamos. Um, Dirk Jameson and, uh, and Chris Adams, who were generals in the Strategic Air Command. Uh, Jeff Kennedy, who was a nuclear uh, missile, ballistic missile technician. I can go on and on and on about experts in this field who devoted enormous amounts of time to me to educate me on this subject. And to the degree that my book has any enduring value, it's really because of these people and their knowledge of the subject. And so to the reporters in the room right now who might want to write about nuclear weapons, my advice would be to listen. And the experts who've been assembled for this conference are extraordinary. And the knowledge that they have about what's happening right now is of urgent importance. So my advice would be to seek them out and listen and try to take their knowledge and bring it to the wider public. Um, there's somebody who I didn't talk to while I was writing Command and Control, um, and I really wish I had. And um, I think he is there with you in New Mexico. I saw him uh, on the list of experts. Uh, I've gotten to know him since my book came out. His name is Sig Hecker, and he's a former head of Los Alamos. And this man has an encyclopedic knowledge, not only of nuclear weapons design, 
but of the current threat posed by these weapons. And I urge you to seek him out and use him as the kind of resource that I benefited from enormously in writing about this subject. Uh, I wish that my book was of only historical importance. I wish that it was like a book on Louis the Fourteenth and his court with interesting stories and anecdotes, but really, you know, only worth reading because of the, you know, the charm or the, the thrills of the story. Uh, as I said at the beginning, the, the danger from nuclear weapons right now is profound. Uh, during the Cold War, we had a nuclear arms race between two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. Now we have a multipolar arms race with nine countries that possess nuclear weapons, and all nine of the nuclear powers are modernizing their arsenals. And that is an incredibly dangerous and unstable situation. Um, the outcome of Russia's war on Ukraine is also going to have an impact on whether we have more than nine uh, countries with nuclear weapons. Russia has been using nuclear blackmail for a year and a half in order to attempt to um, destroy Ukraine and its government. And if that nuclear blackmail works, if Russia's almost daily threats to use nuclear weapons are successful, that will be an extraordinary incentive for other countries to get nuclear weapons. So on that list would be Iran, uh, maybe Saudi Arabia, uh, Japan, perhaps, South Korea, Turkey. And again and again, during my research for command and control, the people who designed our nuclear weapons, the people who came up with the strategy for managing our nuclear weapons, the people who literally in a day-to-day -day way operated our nuclear weapons systems told me they were amazed that we got out of the Cold War without a city being destroyed by a nuclear weapon, either in a nuclear war or due to an accident. And my book is really about how hard it is, even with the best of intentions, to control this technology. I mean, we invented this machine, the nuclear weapons. We probably build the best, safest nuclear weapons ever. And yet we've come close again and again to having nuclear catastrophes with our own weapons, let alone a deliberate nuclear war. Well, think about countries that don't have the same industrial skills and capacities or technological skills that we do having nuclear weapons. Um, the more countries that have nuclear weapons, the more likely one will be used. And again, it's almost miraculous that there has not been a city destroyed since Nagasaki in August of 1945. So for those of you who are interested in this subject, and I, I think it is just one of the most important issues that we face today, there are a series of questions that I think have to be addressed in 2023 about nuclear weapons. And here are some of those questions. Why do we have nuclear weapons? What are they for? How might they be used? And how many is enough? I mean, we've lost sight of the unbelievable destructive capability that exists right now, particularly uh, in the United States and Russia, the two countries that possess about 90% of the world's nuclear weapons. Uh, the Russians are coming up with a new intercontinental ballistic missile. It's nicknamed Satan-2. That missile, one missile, will carry 16 warheads. One Satan-2 missile theoretically has the ability to destroy every American city with a population over one million, just one 
of those Satan II missiles. And Russia says that it's going to deploy 40 to 50 of those missiles. Uh, right now, our ballistic missile submarines, the Ohio class uh, ballistic missile submarines, have the capability, one submarine, one Ohio class submarine has the capability to destroy the capital city of every country in the United Nations. Just one of them. And um, we are building uh, new uh, Columbia class ballistic missile submarines as part of our modernization. And these Columbia class submarines are going to be the most expensive weapons ever constructed. The first Columbia class ballistic submar missile submarine is going to cost $15 billion just one submarine. And additional submarines in this class will probably cost anywhere from 10 to $14 billion. This is an extraordinary, extraordinary amount of money when you think about the fact that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, our leading public health organization, uh, has an annual budget of about $9 billion a year. Uh, the United States is undergoing a modernization of its arsenal that is expected to cost $2 trillion. Now, how is that money being spent? Uh, what are these weapons systems? Uh, what are they intended to do? And I get back to the question, how much is enough? Uh, are, you know, one of the questions that I have that I hope someone in this room will answer is if we're going to spend $15 billion on a single submarine, uh, how safe is that submarine going to be from an undersea drone that, you know, five years from now, six years from now, are other countries going to have a capability to take a weapon that maybe costs $100,000 and destroy a weapon that costs $15 billion? Now, these aren't just budgetary questions. These are questions of existential importance. One of the things that forgot, it's forgotten about nuclear deterrence, and nuclear deterrence is an academic term. And what it really refers to is hostage taking. Uh, nuclear deterrence is a threat to use nuclear weapons against an adversary to prevent that adversary from using its nuclear weapons against you. This is, in, you know, if you get behind the theory, essentially, this is threatening to kill the civilians of another country so that country doesn't kill your civilians. It's, again, like medieval hostage taking. And it's worth keeping in mind that the Geneva Conventions prohibited the killing of civilians. And it's really worth keeping that in mind, not only in terms of nuclear deterrence, but in terms of what is happening right this minute in Ukraine. I'm gonna to read to you Protocol 2 of the Geneva Convention. Quote, the civilian population shall not be the object of attack. Acts or threats of violence, the primary purpose of which is to spread terror among a pro pro protected civilian population is prohibited. So basic rules of conduct in warfare are being violated as I stand here. And one could argue that nuclear weapons are inherently, inherently a violation of the Geneva Conventions because their greatest utility is in massive destruction in terms of mass murder. Uh, the Chinese are building new ballistic missile fields and China has the fastest growing nuclear arsenal in the world. And, you know, the argument that sometimes made that we can use nuclear weapons as counterforce weapons, that is to target other, you know, 
military targets, not civilian populations. The problem is, is that where China is building its ballistic missiles right now, if we were to attack them and destroy them with our nuclear weapons, we would kill probably half the population of Beijing, maybe, maybe 10 million people. These numbers just seem incomprehensible. This level of destruction seems completely unrealistic, but hundreds of billions of dollars are being spent on weapons perfectly capable of achieving this level of mass murder and destruction. Uh, it is remarkable that the nuclear taboo has not been broken since the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That is to say, nuclear weapons have not been used against civilians since 1945. But the question that we really have to ponder and worry about is what happens when the nuclear taboo is broken? Now, Russia has low yield, maybe even ultra low yield nuclear weapons that it could use in Ukraine that would cause nowhere near the damage uh, that the destruction of the dam yesterday has caused and will cause. What happens if Russia uses one of those weapons, one low yield nuclear weapon to kill Zelensky in a decapitation strike to destroy some military target or airfield? What will happen? The answer is nobody knows. Nobody knows what happens next. And when the United States used two nuclear weapons against Japanese cities, these nuclear weapons were used when the United States was the only country in the world that had nuclear weapons. So we are in a very, very dangerous place with huge uncertainties and a risk that will probably become greater before it is diminished. And the reporters in the room have an incredible opportunity because this subject is not being written about enough. It's not being written about thoroughly. And there are just all kinds of questions that need to be explored and that can be explored. Um, I want to end on an encouraging note, which is that when I was young, we really thought that there was a good chance we would all die in a nuclear war. And thus far, we haven't. And one of the reasons I believe that the Cold War ended peacefully is there was extraordinarily good reporting on nuclear weapons. Uh, and I think that made a huge difference. That reporting provided people with the knowledge of the threat and people took action to protest against this situation. Uh, the 1982 rally against nuclear weapons in Central Park was considered at the time the largest political protest in American history. Uh, there were many books written about nuclear weapons. There were films made about nuclear weapons. The Day After, which was broadcast in 1983, it was a television film, it was seen by 100 million people. Uh, Ronald Reagan watched The Day After and you know, it really, the day after was a film about a, you know, a nuclear attack on the United States, and it scared Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan was elected president, committed to enlarging our nuclear arsenal and giving us a nuclear war fighting capability, and he left office determined to abolish nuclear weapons. He became an abolitionist, and I really believe that the writing about nuclear weapons, that the films that were made about nuclear weapons contributed to the activism surrounding nuclear weapons, and that helped the Cold War end peacefully. And we need that same sort of writing, that same sort of reporting, and I'm not apocalyptic. Um, I wouldn't be doing any of this work if I thought we were all inevitably doomed to die 
in a mushroom cloud. Um, but I'm concerned. I'm deeply concerned. Uh, when I finish my prison book, I'm going to try to write an inve another investigative piece uh, on nuclear weapons, something that I've been thinking about. But I really think a new generation needs to take up this subject. It couldn't be more urgent and more important. And when I look at the field trips that you guys are going to do, uh, the Trinity site, I can't think of a better place for you to go. It's where it all began. It's the, it's the beginning of all this. And um, the National Museum of, Na of Nuclear Science and History is an incredible place. Uh, I think that every member of Congress should be obligated to go there. Uh, what's remarkable when you go there and you look at these nuclear weapons is that these were some of the most top secret weapons they were the most top secret weapons in our arsenal. You could have been imprisoned for taking a picture of one of these things, literally. And now they're just there. Some of them are out in a gravel uh, outdoor space, rusting. And to me, it's an apt symbol of a world that I hope to see where the nuclear weapons are no longer hidden away in silos and no longer underwater in submarines that cost $15 billion each, but that all the nuclear weapons are either dismantled or they're in museums, um, open to the public, rusting away, obsolete. Anyway, thank you for inviting me to speak. I hope that really good, interesting conversations come out of this conference. And, um, I wish you guys all the best luck in bringing attention to this profoundly important subject. Thank you.